All right. I hope that's better because it's not going to get any better than this. So this is who to blame for all your problems, conducting blameless postmortems. I'm Ben Barry. I'm a DevOps engineer here in Seattle. I've been doing that for about five years or so. Uh, most of my recent work as a DevOps engineer has been focused on release engineering, um, uh, observability for services, and site reliability. Uh, most presenters put a picture of themselves on their About Me slide. I couldn't find any pictures of myself, and my face is right here, so this is a dog instead. So I'm going to talk about conducting postmortems, um, that is, blameless postmortems. Uh, first off, what a postmortem is, what a blameless postmortem is, why you should conduct blameless postmortems, and how to do so. So first off, what is a postmortem? There are two common uses of the term in software. Uh, first, that, first of all is that it can be a document detailing what happened during an incident. Second, it can be a meeting held to review an incident, usually resulting in the creation of such a document. I'll cover it in more detail later, but generally whenever I say incident here, I'm referring to something along the lines of an outage, service degradation, data breach, something like that. We had a really bad day one day. So why would you conduct a postmortem? Prod broke. We fixed it, call a day. Uh, first off, holding a postmortem helps us understand better how our systems work and how they don't. Your system is, if your system is complex, I promise it is if you're writing software, the people who work in, on it have an incomplete and inaccurate view of how the system works. Incidents help us highlight where these gaps and inaccuracies lie. Reviewing incidents after the fact will help improve your understanding of your systems. If you do this as a group, and share what you found, you help, under, help improve the understanding of your whole organization. Failures are your system telling you that it doesn't work the way you think it does. Postmortems let you listen to it. So you're sold on postmortems. I'm glad we got that covered. Now what was the bit about being blameless? Being blameless boils down to one thing. You assume that every person made the correct decision at every point along the way, given the information that was available to them at the time. This means that if your causes, root or proximate, include something along the lines of human error, you haven't really identified your, your causes. By approaching post postmortems blamelessly, you start with the assumption that human error is not a valid conclusion. The primary goal of blamelessness is to encourage, sorry, primary goal of blamelessness is encouraging honesty and transparency. When you include blame in your postmortems, you encourage people to hide information and to distance themselves from problems. Let's say Richard reboots a server, and that's to try to fix a problem, and that ends up making it worse. If we hold a postmortem, and we find a root cause that's something along the lines of operator error on Richard's part, we'll probably end up with action items that are something like, take away Richard's production access, or make Richard get approval before he can reboot a server. Uh, or we might even fire him. So next time we have an outage, will he tell us honestly what he did? Or if we fire him, will Remy tell us what happened during the postmortem for their failed deployment? By removing blame from postmortems, we encourage open, honest, complete feedback from the people who know best how the system operates and how it failed to do so during this incident. Reviewing incidents blamelessly also shifts your perspective by preventing Monday morning quarterbacking. In the field guide to understanding human error, Sidney Decker tells us that human error is an attribution, a judgment that we make after the fact. In other words, human error is not a class of behavior, it's how we classify actions after we know the outcomes. People don't shift between error mode and normal mode. They take input from their surroundings, apply their knowledge and expertise, and take actions based on that. This also helps us remember that people don't come to work to fail. They come to work to succeed. Most of the time, your coworkers are not the ones causing the system, or your coworkers are never the ones causing the system to break. Most of the time, they're the ones doing the messy work, little nudges, corrections, and cleanups throughout the day. They're doing the little things needed to keep your systems online. The people closest to the problems, the ones you'll inevitably single out in a blameful postmortems, they're the ones, they're the experts maintaining these systems. If we look at how people behaved and recall that they want to succeed, we realize that they only do things that make sense at the time. When we realize that, we have to stop saying, 
this is Darla's fault because she pulled the lever and start saying, why did Darla pull that lever? Surely, if it made sense to her at the time, it'll make sense in the future. Was this an observability problem? Was this an interface problem? Could the system somehow have prevented her from pulling that lever? You might notice that I used names in all the previous examples. Blamelessness is not about anonymizing actions or about discussing the system without mentioning the humans in it. Here's an anonymized version, just so we're clear what we're talking about. Trigger, an engineer powered down the main foo server. Anonymizing says, we want to blame you, but we don't know who you are. Or maybe, we want to blame you, but Ben said we couldn't. <laughs> if you anonymize, what will probably happen is someone will read the anonymized statement during the meeting, pause, and then look conspicuously at James, <laughs> who was indeed the, the engineer who powered down the system. Worse, you could remove all mention of people involved, saying, and that says, nobody works here. The system just does these things on its own, and it makes it even harder for us to understand what happened. So that would be, trigger, the main foo server was powered down. How, why, did we lose power to the rack? Did the server have a kernel panic? Was this sabotaged by our competitors? Better is, trigger, James powered off the main foo server. Stating what someone did is not the same thing as assigning blame to them. So about this time, you might be wondering, how do we ensure accountability uh, if we don't blame anyone? At first glance, this seems directly at odds with ensuring accountability. In actuality, moving from blame, or removing blame from incidents turns your culture from backward-looking accountability to forward-looking accountability. If you have a blameful culture, after an incident, you might take away an engineer's access from certain systems, you might require them to get permission to take certain actions, or you might even fire them. The next time there is a similar incident, that engineer's skills will not be available as readily if they're available at all. And the incident will probably not go any better. Your incident last time probably ended in an, a, a diagnosis of operator error. So other engineers didn't get the opportunity to learn what the engineers involved knew, and they have to learn on the job. Compare that to a blameless environment. After your first incident, the engineers li involved likely learned more about the incident during the postmortem, as did the engineers who were not involved. Changes to the system were probably made to make this type of incident less likely. And that is, real changes, not don't do this anymore. Even if the system itself is not more resilient to this failure mode, engineers are now better equipped to handle it quickly and effectively. By soliciting open, honest feedback from the people who were there when the, everything went wrong, the people who were there when everything got fixed, we turn them into teachers. The information gathered in a postmortem helps make your experts more knowledgeable in their field. But what do you do if your work is too important for all of this? You might do what the US Forest Service does. In response to an incident classified as serious, that's generally an on-duty fatality, the US Forest Service follows their coordinated response protocol and learning review process. In the introduction to the guide on this process, they say that they developed it, quote, as a result of the agency's transition from focusing on finding cause to striving to understand conditions and influences that had an effect on decisions and actions. The guide goes on to say, the learning review process begins with the understanding that if the actions made had not, or if the actions had not made sense to those involved, they would, not, they would have done something differently. Conditions shape decisions and actions, and revealing these conditions will help the agency design more robust and resilient regulations, policies, and procedures. In other words, a more robust and resilient system. That's pretty big talk, but it doesn't just end with talk. This is actually codified by an executive order in, and the Code of Federal Regulations, which say, quote, information gathered by learning review personnel will not be used as the basis for disciplinary action or to place blame on employees. No attempts to gather information resulting from other coordinated response protocol functions or activities such as critical incident peer support will be made. Not only will the US Forest Service not blame you, they will not allow their, others to use the, their results to blame you. If that's not enough, maybe you could look to the NTSB or the National Transportation Safety Board, 
The NTSB investigates accidents in the aviation, highway, marine, pipeline, and railroad modes, as well as accidents related to the transportation of hazardous materials. They say this in their instructions for conducting public hearings on accident investigations. There are no adverse parties or interests. There are no formal pleadings. The board does not determine liability, nor does it attempt to do so. For this reason, questions directed to issues of liability will not be permitted. I must emphasize the fact-finding nature of the hearing. Our sole purpose is to determine how and why this accident occurred and what can be done to prevent similar occurrences in the future. If your work is more pressing than the NTSB or the Forest Service, we can meet up later and you can tell me how you run your postmortems. <laughs> so how do you get started? First, you need to make sure that everyone on your team understands what blamelessness means. As a reminder, that is, assume every person made the correct decision at every point along the way, given the information that was available to them at the time. We have that definition in the template we use to construct our postmortem documents, and typically the person running the postmortem meeting will remind everyone of this at the beginning of the meeting. Next, it's ideal to draw up specific procedures before the first incident. You'll probably refine them a bit, but it helps to have something in place before your first time through. Then set some parameters on when you will hold your postmortems. Here are some suggestions. Anytime an outage is declared, anytime service is degraded for a certain amount of time, anytime a human needs to intervene to correct a process that should be automatic, or anytime a stakeholder requests it. It might be a good idea to consider running a few postmortems on near misses if you don't frequently have incidents that meet these criteria. This gives you some practice before the big one hits, but it also, you'll probably learn something along the way. So I mentioned earlier the postmortem document, uh, and here's what it has in it. First is some fairly obvious general kind of stuff. The date and authors, obviously, when the incident occurred and who wrote the document. The status, that's where we are in the process. This is usually draft when we start writing it and completed after we've held all of our meetings. The summary, that is, what happened briefly. In this case, all instances of the web server stopped responding to requests for approximately one hour. And the impact, that's why this mattered. Users were unable to view the visual guide for one hour. And then detection, which is how we found out about this. Graham, an internal user, tried to access the page but could not. Next, we talk about the cause. Um, so first we have the root causes. Uh, notice that this is a plural because there are usually many causes to an incident. So in this case, incompatible versions of Docker and Docker Compose caused standard out to stop accepting input after a certain number of bytes were sent to it. Java processes write logs synchronously. We don't test this service using Docker Compose until we release. Alerts were misconfigured, so we did not know about individual, or we did not know about individual instances becoming unhealthy. And then the trigger, which is what happened to make this, or what caused this to happen today. Uh, in this case, it was that more verbose logging and a longer time between deployments meant that we actually filled up logs enough to trigger this bug. Then we talk about what we did to fix this uh, and what we think we want to do or need to do to prevent it in the future. So the resolution, again, what we did to fix this, we turned on instance termination to, uh, for failed health checks and we pinned Docker Compose and Docker versions in Ansible deployment scripts. And then a list of action items, things to follow up on afterwards. Once we've entered these items into our uh, ticket tracking system, in this case Jira, we add a link to them. And then finally, the lessons learned, these come in three subcategories. What went, what went well, in this case, changing the health check behavior to termination quickly made the system more consistently available for users. What went wrong? We don't have a staging environment that matches production for this service. We never tested alerting, so we relied on user reports to find the issue. And where we got lucky, so these are some near misses, things that could have gone worse but didn't. Uh, so in this case, an internal user discovered this because it was before public launch, and CloudFront caching hid most of the errors from users. Then we have the timeline. I don't have an example here because it's very long. Uh, that is, anything that happened involving this issue in as great of detail as possible. Uh, this is all in chronological order with timestamps wherever feasible. Uh, we also highlight in bold the places where the issue started, where the issue was detected, the, where the impact was mitigated, and where the issue was resolved. 
and then finally supporting information. And this is sort of a grab bag. This is anything that might help understand the issue in more detail or might document the timeline better. This is often links to logs queries or metrics queries, uh, thread dumps and stack traces. I've even included my bash history in this before. Uh, just anything that helps people understand what's going on. So then before the meeting, uh, what do you do? First, the person who led the incident response should fill out the, a draft of the postmortem. Uh, it should not be complete at this time. You only enter the date, the known parts of the timeline, the trigger, the resolution, and the detection. Leave blank, any, or leave any of these blank that you don't know the answer to. This should be done as soon as possible, uh, definitely within about a day of the, end of the incident. This person should also schedule the meeting. Uh, again, this should be as soon as practical. Uh, usually this happens within a couple days. Everyone who, is direct, who directly worked on the incident should be uh, at the meeting, and anyone who was affected by it or just is curious about it should be welcome. And then when you actually get to running the meeting, um, first off, someone other than the person who led the incident should uh, run the meeting. People too close to the incident will tend to gloss over details and make assumptions about other people's knowledge. Um, of course, they will end up being the people who do most of the talking, but they shouldn't be the ones who are leading everything. The meeting should follow a rough structure, but it doesn't need to be strict or permissive, or strict or prescriptive, um, and I'll cover that structure right now. So you start by giving a background on systems or processes involved. Uh, this is just so that everyone is sort of on the same page about what we're talking about. This is especially important if there are people in the room who uh, don't work on these systems but were affected by them or anything like that. Uh, then you move on to the summary, the detection, the, and the impact if you know it. Basically, what you're doing here is telling people briefly what this incident looked like from the outside. Next, you work through the timeline, referencing any supporting documents along the way. This timeline is the most time consuming and also most important part of the procedure. You work through what happened from start to finish, and while you're doing this, you wanna make sure that everyone is comfortable asking questions whenever they need clarification. These questions should not be limited to technical details, but should also probe into things like how people recognized issues, where people sought help, and whether or not they received it, uh, and how people made decisions. This is the interesting part, and this is where you really start to learn about new things in your system, or le learn new things about your system. Then you move on to the root causes. Uh, and again, this is a plural, there's more than one. Uh, some teams find it helpful to use a formalized technique for, formal, or for root causes. Um, the most common that I've heard of is the five whys. It's definitely not necessary. It's helpful for some teams, but it's also possible to follow a formal technique and end up with the wrong answer. Uh, discussing root causes is also usually where blame starts to creep in. Um, sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it's not. Here are a couple of things you can look for. The first is alternative actions. So this is when you compare the actions that someone took to actions that they might have taken or compare actions that they didn't take to actions that they should have taken. Um, this often includes things like you rolled back instead of trying to push out a hot fix or you did X, but this one confluence page says to do Y. Then we have cherry picking. So this is constructing a story that only exists in hindsight by selecting data that support an existing conclusion. For instance, if we start with the conclusion that Ben doesn't know his way around Kubernetes, uh, and then we can look for data that supports that conclusion, such as uh, Ben consulted the documentation a little more than I would have thought he would have, or Ben mistyped a bunch of commands. We can then construct a convincing story that the outage was caused by Ben's lack of knowledge around Kubernetes. Cherry picking basically says, I know the cause and I can sift through the data to prove it. We have something that's sort of the opposite and that's called the shopping bag. This says, I know the outcome. There's all this data here in this bag. You should have seen it coming. The problem is that we ignore the fact that we're collecting this data in hindsight. This data may have been available, but was it observable? Or was there conflicting data? Or is it even possible, given this data, to predict the outcome that we now know happened? These cause-forming these cause-forming traps all exist because we know we now know how the incident ended. If you find yourself using them when looking for causes, it's a warning sign that you're probably looking to blame and to explain and not to learn and understand. 
Finally, we discuss what we learned along the way. This is where you start looking for remediations, but this discussion should not be limited to action items. Broader topics should also be welcome here. People should feel free to throw in ideas about what they learned and what could be improved. This can also lead to more questions about clarifications or to add context. Note that we've waited until now to discuss recommendation. It's likely that throughout the whole process, people start thinking up ideas of how to make things better. It's important that people write these ideas down and discuss them together at the same time. This keeps the meeting on track, this reduces overlap, and helps people better consider the whole picture before making suggestions. The discussion should turn out a list of recommendations that's not necessarily well-formed action items. These recommendations should, uh, should be thought over and discussed in more detail before considering them tickets to be worked on. This can happen as the final stage of the post-mortem, but it's best to give people time to ponder what they've learned. Ideally, you would hold a separate meeting for this two or more days after the post-mortem itself, and this might have less people in this meeting because you don't need quite as many observers. When you work through your recommendations, though, do be careful about knee-jerk reactions and over-engineering. It's really easy to take a bunch of engineers and put them in a room and give them a problem and end up with a lot of engineering solutions, but that's not always the best thing. Uh, remember that adding more steps to a process it might make people less likely to follow the prescribed procedure, uh, and adding more ifs and thens to your code means it's harder to reason about and adds more places for bugs to hide. Also, make sure that these action items are specific, measurable, actionable, reasonable, and time-bound. Uh, improve performance is not an action item. Reduce 99th percentile response times to 50 milliseconds is. Remember, though, it is possible to have a very good postmortem and not leave with any action items. The primary goal of a postmortem is learning. The action items are ancillary. So what do you do after your postmortem? Well, obviously work through any action items that you came up with, and once they're done, update the document to uh, reflect that. More importantly, though, share your postmortems. Send out an email or a Slack inviting people to read them. Put them somewhere where everyone can read them whenever they want. Remember, we did this to gain knowledge. Sharing it means more people benefit from that knowledge. And finally, just thank you. I'd like to say thank you to all of the organizers, the volunteers, and obviously all of you for sitting through my talk. Um, this is generally the part where someone would say, I'm looking for a job, or we're hiring, or I have a thing to sell you. I have none of those things for you, so I gave you another dog. <laughs>